Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. This is a question and answer session for May 21st. Public Health Director Annette Rodriguez and Dr. Chris Bird will be addressing questions received this week. Please feel free to add your follow-up questions to chat. Today's topics are vaccination, vaccination efforts and the spread of COVID, and of course our weekly life, healthy lifestyle check-in. Dr. Bird. All right, thanks, Jason. Can you let me know if my audio gets choppy, um, just in case, because my computer seems to be struggling right now? Uh, and if um, it does get too choppy, we'll, we'll need you to take over the questioning, okay? All right, sounds good. So, Annette, uh, let's start off with how have the vaccination efforts gone this past week? Uh, it's still going very well. Uh, I'm glad to say, you know, the mall is still going strong. So uh, that's definitely good news. We've also been kind of all over the place this week. Um, we did have to cancel because of weather on Wednesday. We were at American Bank Center, but we had to cancel uh, due to flooding. So um, today we're at Flower Bluff uh, High School this morning. So we did over 50 uh, kiddos there. So that was good news. We're trying to get to as many schools as possible before the end of the school year. So um, if you're on and you hear this and you want us to come out, just call us and we'll try to squeeze you in sometime. But we're doing well. We've done uh, over 123,000 vaccines just by the health district alone. And uh, in combination with the other providers in Nueces County, uh, we're on the definitely, definitely on the right path. Okay, um, since you talked about schools and there was a new change in the, uh, in the laws this past week or the, the, the regulations governing mask wearing in schools, um, let's take this opportunity. Can, can you clarify how uh, the new governor's order affects uh, people going to school here in the coastal bend? So, you know, uh, what, what, what I've seen on it is that uh, everything kind of stays in effect for the schools until after June the 4th. And so I think that's, you know, the end of school and then before the new uh, school year starts. So nothing really changes for the schools because they understand that those kids aren't all vaccinated yet. We just started on the 12 years and older. Uh, but after June 4th, it looks like it's going to be very similar to uh, the way his orders stand right now. Basically, which says that if, uh, if you're a business, you can't mandate that people wear masks when they come into your establishment which I think is okay as long as those individuals that have not had COVID-19 or have not been vaccinated realize that the mask is to protect themselves and continue to wear that mask. So there's nothing against, there's nobody going to find anybody if you're wearing a mask. The only ones that can be fined if an establishment is mandating that you wear a mask. And so again, the mask is to protect yourself. It's no longer to protect others because others are vaccinated, the ones that don't have a mask on. So uh, we would encourage you to continue to wear your mask if you have not been vaccinated or if you have not had COVID-19 to wear your mask. So, or better yet, just come in and get vaccinated and then you can also take off your mask after you've been fully vaccinated. Okay, so something I wanna clarify, um, the governor's order, it applies to more than just state facilities. It's also private businesses, is that right? You know, for private businesses, what I read was that um, that the governor cannot tell private businesses how to run their business. And so while he's uh, still saying that they do not have to mandate masks, that's going to be up to that private establishment, if you will. Okay, so it's at a state or a governmental facility or building in the state where they can't mandate mask wearing, but a private business still could. Is that correct? Right, or a federal building. That's correct. Or a federal building, they can't mandate. Exactly right. So, But the places that can mandate are, and, and it's still required, are going to be in public transit. So if you're on a bus or you're on a plane or you're on a train, <laughs> then you are required to wear a mask because of the closed congregate setting. And you have people from all over different places getting on the planes. And so it's better if you wear a mask whether you've been vaccinated or not. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's getting quite confusing now with all these different uh, competing mask uh, orders coming out. It seems like every week there's something new happening. So I just want to make sure we're able to clarify as much as possible for our listening audience. So uh, in the end, the way this affects everybody out there, 
is uh, if you want to wear a mask, keep wearing your mask. Uh, no, nobody's going to penalize you for that. And um, I think we just want to encourage everybody to be respectful of everybody else. And there's no reason to uh, go after people that are or are not wearing masks. You know, we want to, you know, get, get along in society here. Okay, uh, let's uh, go to some of the questions. Let's see, are there any free COVID-19 testing sites in Nueces County? Yes, uh, so on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at the Old Memorial Hospital from 7.30 to 1, there's still COVID testing there, and so you're able to go there. It probably takes about a week, though, to get your results back. Okay, and sounds like that's going to be a PCR test? Yes, The gold is. standard? People need to just understand they need to plan ahead because people are using it for travel purposes. And so they're wanting to go and travel tomorrow and it doesn't work that way. So they need to plan ahead, get those results, you know, and then uh, plan their travel. Right, okay. Uh, and if you're going to get the test because you're sick and it's taking a week for you to get the result back, um, that's the time period where you wanna self-isolate. Um, and when, even though you're not sure if you had COVID or not, I know that having had COVID myself until I saw the positive result, I was convinced I didn't have COVID. I'm sure most people are the same, but you know, make sure that you're self isolating. Okay, um, next topic is on vaccine clinics. If more than six to 12 weeks have passed since my first dose of, COVID, of the COVID-19 vaccine, can I still get my second dose? Yes, absolutely. And you only need your second dose. So it's not like you're going to start the series over. So if you've gotten your first one and it's been more than six weeks or even more than 12 weeks, uh, come in, we'll give you the second dose and then that's it. You're done. So and, until we find out, um, you know, when people need an annual booster. Yep. This is a popular question because I think we had something very similar last week. Uh, let's say if a if a patron lost their COVID, yeah, this is a good one. Um, this is one I didn't know the answer to last week. Um, if a patron lost their COVID-19 vaccination card, how can they get a duplicate? So they can either call the health district, 826-7200, option two, or they can come by the mall. And um, if they remember the date that they were vaccinated, they can come by the mall and then we can make them a card there. So we have cards, CDC cards there, and we can just put the two dates on one card and you'll be set to go. Okay, um, because the, the travel just came up, um, I'm embarking on travel to uh, uh, see a family member that was um, recently had a heart attack. And um, is there any reason why I need to bring my vaccination cards with me? You know, I guess it depends on where you're traveling to. Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably a good practice just to keep it with you. You might have somebody or something that comes up that somebody wants to know if you've been vaccinated. So um, yeah, it'd be a good it'd be a good idea to take it with you. Okay, yeah, I didn't think about that, but uh, good good uh, advice there. Okay, um, kids and COVID. If I take my twelve year old child uh, or older to get vaccinated, what do I need to bring with me? You just need to bring your twelve year old with you <laughs> or older. All so right, just bring that. You say you're their parent or you're their guardian. Um, you sign for them to get vaccinated. All is good. You don't even have to be there as a parent. If you re pre-register, we still have our registration open on um, our CC Texas uh, um, website. You can pre-register. When they come to the mall, they can come in and we'll still vaccinate them even if you're not with them. I had misspoken early. I thought that the parent had to be with them, but they don't. As long as they... Uh, given permission, whether it's in writing or verbally. And so if the child's at the mall and they want to get vaccinated and you want to, you know, call mom and say, hey, mom's giving permission, we'll just note that and they'll be good to go. We'll vaccinate them for you. All right. That sounds like it's very convenient, right? Very okay. easy. Okay. Uh, the next question, I, I'll, I'll handle this. Uh, do parents need to bring their child's birth certificate to prove they're 12 or older? The answer is no. Um, just, uh, you know, for, for any age, uh, there's no uh, ID check or anything like that happening, correct? 
That is correct. Okay, what advice do you have for parents to do or not do before and after receiving the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine? So, so a lot of parents, you know, we're kind of uh, taught early on when we have our little ones that we, that we actually give them like Tylenol before we actually take them for vaccines. Um, that, that used to be kind of the practice. For this particular vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, they ask that you not take any fever reducing medication before you get your vaccine. You can take it after if you need it, uh, but you do not need to take it in advance of getting your COVID-19 vaccine. I think the other real important part to this is that uh, now co-administration of vaccines is allowed, which means that if you need to get your meningitis, you can get your meningitis and you can get your COVID-19 at the same time. So you don't have to wait the 14 days anymore. The same thing with the flu vaccine. If you need to get the flu vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine, you can get them both in the same time period and it's not an issue. So there's been so many real world studies. They've seen that this is not problematic. And so they're allowing back to school vaccines at the same time you get your COVID-19 vaccine. All right, that's, that's convenient for somebody like me where every time I get the flu vaccine, I pretty much get flu symptoms for about a day. If I could wrap that up together with COVID at the same time, that would be, you know, that's convenient. <laughs> That would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's good news. Okay. Um, healthy lifestyle check-in. So how, how have you been doing uh, with your New Year's resolution to lose the COVID, however many pounds it was? Trying really hard. Started keto this week. Um, I think I'm going to like that, you know. So I'm doing everything. I do it slowly, you know. It's amazing how when you want to, you follow your physician's orders <laughs> and don't lose weight rapidly because you might gain it back. So I'm still doing it, trying, um, exercising, riding my bike, um, just doing some exercising around the house as well. You know, you can always exercise indoors, thinking about getting uh, going back to the gym. Um, not sure if I want to do that quite yet. Um, but anyway, at least I'm doing something every day. So that helps. All right. How about yourself? Um. You know, the, with the end of the semester, there's not a whole lot of planned exercise happening, but, you know, maintaining the yard and things like that I've been uh, doing, and my weight stayed about the same. So I'm kind of holding even, and then now that the summer's starting, I'm hoping to get into a, a bicycling uh, re regimen again and uh, maybe lose another 10 pounds or so and get closer to my goal. All right, so um, those are the questions that we had uh, before we started today. Uh, Tiffany or Jason, do we have new questions? Uh, we have some longer questions, actually. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this, okay? What is the primary way COVID spreads? Um, mainly people without masks indoors for long periods of time? Is it 15 minutes of close contact with no mask via touching objects? Is it still transmitted in air indoors if wearing a mask? And how long do you need to be exposed? Is it correct to assume that not wearing a mask in large, crowded, indoor, less ventilated space still increases the chance of contracting COVID-19, just a less serious case? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first shot at this. So uh, wearing a mask certainly does decrease your probability of contracting COVID in a crowded indoor space. Um, the, uh, the probability of contracting COVID increases as you have more and more people in a, in a tight enclosed space, uh, that, that, that's still true. Uh, it's, uh, all evidence is indicating that contact uh, based uh, contraction of COVID is rare to non-existent and it's really all airborne and not just air, airborne but, but aerosolized and we've known this for a long time now as you know last summer that we were able to confirm through scientific reports that COVID was what was aerosolized and that's the big reason to wear a mask. Um, and, uh, you know, six feet apart helps because that's maybe how far droplets, like droplets you could see in the air travel that are carrying COVID, but 
uh, droplets that you can't see, that's the aerosolized part, are also um, you know, where COVID can be uh, um, spread and contracted. And those are the ones that can float in the air for a long time, uh, more than a couple seconds, more than six feet away. And that's really why this was so hard to control. Um, so I know there are a couple other questions in there, but I'm not great with answering, you know, five questions all at the same time. So Anna, Annette, do you want to, you know, pick up where I left off? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, uh, besides airborne transmission, uh, the most common one is droplet transmission. So that's actually where you're in close proximity to another person and they're talking loudly or they're singing. Uh, close by you or they're screaming uh, or they're sneezing, you know, it's real easy to pick up those uh, those droplets from uh, from those sources and then actually contracting COVID as well. So uh, droplet transmission, again, like uh, Dr. Bird said, airborne transmission, definitely, you know, uh, just uh, those are the really small, small particles that linger in the air uh, after you've already coughed and sneezed and left the area. Uh, somebody behind you can come through there and pick that up as well. And uh, like you said as well, uh, con contact uh, transmission is not uh, uh, as concerning as we thought initially. So we've learned a lot, um, but 15 minutes is kind of the, the, the amount of time that they give you, saying that if you're in for, for 15 minutes or more with somebody that's had COVID-19, you know, you could actually contract COVID-19 yourself. I would say be careful with, you know, uh, a specific time. It could be 13, it could be 12 minutes. It just depends on how uh, transmissible the virus is that they're carrying. So some of the things that you have to watch are where are you at? You know, are you in uh, New Oasis County and you're asking the question? Are you in India and you're asking the question? Those are completely different, you know, answers to those questions depending on where you're at uh, at the time of uh, COVID transmission. Right, and uh, Thank you. One, one way that you can uh, make assessments of, you know, how much risk is there of contracting COVID out there is just watch the, the number of positive cases. If it's, you know, pretty low, then you're a lot less likely to come in contact with somebody who's had COVID. Um, but from the timing perspective, it sounds like the questioner was like looking for a window of time in which they're probably safe within an indoor area with not wearing your mask. Well, First, I'd say if you have to ask that question, then you should probably just wear your mask. Two, it, I mean, it may take, and that was saying it would take like 10 minutes, 12 minutes. It might take one second. You know, that's that's all the time that, that it takes. And just the longer time that you spend, the higher and higher probability it is that if COVID is there, you'll um, come in contact with it and potentially uh, come in contact with enough of it that you become infected. Um, so if someone's, I'm going to repeat the last question. Is it correct to assume that not wearing a mask in a large crowded indoor, less ventilated space still increases the chance of contracting COVID-19, just le a less serious case? So I would say, yes, it increases your chances of contracting COVID-19. Um, I don't, as far as a less serious case, there's not like a, so on the seriousness of the case, if you wear a mask, it is true that it can decrease your viral load. If you do contract COVID, which decreases the severity of COVID that, that you would, um, of, of the COVID symptoms. But at the same time, there's variants out there like B117 that the way they transmit better is that they, you know, more of them get through our, our, our defenses. There's a higher viral load associated with those and you you can get more sick uh for example in the coastal bend the hospitalization rate per person contracting covid is now higher than it was uh, at the end of 2020 and that's because most likely because of the spread of these variants um and so the first question easy uh yes wearing a mask decreases your chances of getting covid if you want to talk about the severity of it wearing a mask does decrease the severity of contracting COVID. Um, but other things affect the severity too, like there's different variants out there. And the most common one, B117 now is much more virulent uh, and uh, you know, to the point where it's increasing the, the, the hospitalization rate
per person um, that contracts COVID. I think the okay. other part to that, Tiffany, is that um, if you're vaccinated and you're in a congregate setting, uh, and you do pick up COVID-19, you are more likely to have a less severe uh, case of COVID-19 than somebody that, that has not been vaccinated. And I think that's really important for people to know that. So, because somebody that has not been vaccinated or who has not had COVID-19, they don't have um, any protection against this virus. It's still considered a novel virus. And so, uh, if they're trying to figure out the severity, you know, to have a lesser severity of illness, it's by uh, getting vaccinated. Yep, that's right. I, I neglected to say that. Okay. Um, what are the risks of household transmission if you're vaccinated? Very low. Yeah, very low. So what we're seeing is you're getting, we're still seeing a household transmission, but we're seeing it among uh, non-vaccinated family members. And so those are the individuals that are getting uh, COVID-19. So we did have a, a family recently that they didn't get COVID-19 uh, their son picked up COVID-19, so he ended up hospitalized in the ICU, uh, but he was not vaccinated. The parents were vaccinated. <clears throat> he had chosen to wait because he was younger and felt like he had time to wait and ended up in the ICU. So that's very unfortunate. Uh, we want to encourage people not to keep waiting when vaccine is available. If you're thinking about it, go in and get vaccinated. That's going to be the best thing to do right now. Yep. And while that there is. are associations between how severe or how, how uh, negative COVID will be to you, just because you think you're healthy and in good shape, that doesn't mean that you can't end up in the ICU or in the hospital with COVID. Are we okay with people getting a mild form of COVID? Absolutely, you know, that tells us that we have control of the virus and the virus doesn't have control of us. It's kind of like asking, are we okay with people getting a mild case of flu? Absolutely. What you don't want is you don't want flu to control us and everybody that picks up flu ends up hospitalized. So when we're better able to control the virus, that means we're more in control and the pandemic is getting closer to being behind us than where we were a year ago. Right. And um, I would say that right now, until everybody who wants to get a vaccine has gotten a vaccine, even a mild case of COVID is um, important because that's perpetuating the spread of COVID. And it's increasing the probability that these people ha that who haven't had a chance to get vaccinated yet will contract COVID before they've had a chance. So even though ultimately once everybody's had a chance to get vaccinated that wants to, and yeah, this is going to turn into COVID is kind of a, it seems like every, you know, all the experts are saying that COVID is going to become part of the seasonal flu and cold season. Um, once everybody's been exposed, it will be, you know, more of an inconvenience than, you know, the biggest health crisis of the past hundred years. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind that even an asymptomatic case right now is still something that's perpetuating the spread of COVID and increasing the chances of somebody else going to the hospital that hasn't gotten a chance to get vaccinated yet or, or worse. Yeah. How many fully vaccinated residents in Nueces County have recently tested positive for COVID-19 and how many of them were severe cases? If they were severe cases, was it because of high risk comorbidities or another current infection of bronchitis, pneumonia, flu, etc.? So that's a really great question. So uh, I have about over, I want to say just over a hundred uh, individuals that have tested positive by PCR test uh, after being fully vaccinated. And of those uh, hundred, I think it's 102 people, of those 102 individuals, uh, I want to say four of those individuals were hospitalized. So one of them had a co-infection. Um, one of them actually did pass away. So, but this individual uh, also was a cancer patient. So it's really hard when you're looking at these um, charts and you're looking at these statistics to kind of weed everything out, you know, uh, and, and we'll have a lot more time to do all of this at the end of this pandemic where we're, you know, really uh, uh, delving into the statistics. So, but that's what I have right now. I have three that, um, 
uh, four that were hospitalized, one one of the, the four that passed away, um, and everybody else, uh, those uh, 102 individuals, um, they had mild uh, symptoms, like a cold, kind of like you said. So, which is really good news for the vaccine, to say that the vaccine does work. So, for the other three, I really need to look a little bit more into these cases to see, you know, again, uh, was it just right after the second one? Was it within days, you know? Were they infected before they got that second vaccine? You know, so there, there, there's still questions, but again, it's just statistics and um, uh, that you have to really look into these cases more to figure out what happened there. Uh, thank you. Let's see, how close are we to achieving herd immunity? So right now, county. between, I, I'd estimate between 50 and 60% of the coastal bend have either um, recovered from COVID or been vaccinated for uh, COVID at this point. Uh, to achieve herd immunity, which you've probably heard at this point, a lot of experts saying that we're probably never going to get there um, in terms of like technical herd immunity. But to achieve that, uh, we would need to hit somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all people being uh, vaccinated. And the way that it works, it's not going to be 89 percent, 80 to 90 percent of an age group. It's going to be 80 to 90 percent of all people across all age groups. Uh, and it can be uh, location-based. So uh, Nuasis could achieve it while other places don't because in the end it's about what proportion of people that are in a place are immune. Um, and so it can, it's not necessarily something that we achieve um, as a country or as a state, but it can be something that could be achieved at least theoretically um, on a location-by-location -location basis. That being said, um, it seems like based upon vaccination rates and everything and people who are unwilling to get vaccinated that will never really get to herd immunity through vaccination at the very least. And the way we'll probably eventually reach it is through the last remaining people who uh, don't get vaccinated. They'll eventually contract COVID um, in one of the uh, you know, COVID seasons, you know, when, whenever that, that may be. It's in the winter for most of the country. Uh, and that, I don't know if you can speak to flu, but I know with COVID last year, we had um, we had a summer season of, of COVID. And um, right. for everybody yeah. that doesn't get vaccinated, it's just pretty much COVID's not really going to stop circulating. You're eventually going to contract it. Uh, and... Um, you're subject to the same negative outcomes, even if you could contract it two years from now, as if you contracted it now, um, depending on how it evolves. But thus far, it's been evolving to be more uh, more virulent than, than less. Right. And we continue to see variants, you know, and so again, while we're looking at these vaccines and they're holding up uh, a lot better than we had originally thought, the Moderna and the Pfizer, as well as the J&J, which we knew the J&J actually uh, seemed to have the best uh, uh, efficacy against the variants, but we're seeing a lot more variants in the United States. And so we're watching them very carefully. The predominant variant, like Dr. Bird said, is the B117, the UK variant. That is the predominant variant right now here in the United States, but there are other variants that we're still watching. You know, uh, the P1, the Brazilian, it's actually uh, at 5% which uh, is a huge increase compared to where it was, you know, uh, a month ago. And so we're watching uh, the Brazilian variant as well as the South Africa variant and the California variant, the New York variants. We're watching all of these. Some of them are called uh, variants of concern and some of them are called variants of interest. So the last one we had in New Isis County was called a variant of interest. But it's only an interest until it's more predominant in your locality and then it becomes a variant of concern and so we have to watch these variants and again we, we continue to vaccinate with a sense of urgency because there's still individuals out there that uh, haven't been vaccinated but want to get vaccinated and for whatever reason haven't been able to uh, uh, touch base with the clinic and so whatever we can do to help these individuals uh, we're, we're, we're attempting to do. Yeah and the, Thank you. the thing that separates these variants of interest from just other variants 
uh, is that they have a mutation that affects the shape or conformation of the spike protein or some other part of COVID that uh, we think might be related to infectiousness or, or virulence. Okay, last question. When will the Pfizer for ages 12 to 16 be at the Richard Borchard Fairgrounds? 12 to 15. Oh, the <laughs> uh, I don't have a clinic schedule for the Richard Orchard specifically for that age group. That's probably something I need to look at doing. Thank you for that question. Um, we know that the 12 to 15 is offered at the mall every day, seven days a week, and a lot of people are going there. And so when we've been open at the Richard Orchard, we haven't seen a lot of kiddos. We're also thinking, you know, since school's still in, um, uh, session, you know, we've tried to open late for, for, for these kids and they're not coming to these bigger hubs, so they seem to be going more to the mall, but that is something that I will consider uh, for a future clinic. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for submitting questions to everybody that I've messaged or commented or sent smoke signals. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So next Tuesday, I guess I should say, we will be at American Bank Center, and we are doing 12 years and up. We're going to start at noon, and from noon to 4, we're going to do first and second doses for everybody else. And then from 4 to 7, we're going to do 12 years of age and up. That's at American Bank Center. They can just walk in, and we'll vaccinate them. So while we haven't done it at Richard Orchard Fairgrounds yet, we're doing it at American Bank Center on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And Director Thank Rodriguez, you. what uh, what... You know which vaccination that is? That's Pfizer. Pfizer. Pfizer is the only one for um, for children under the age of eighteen. Mm -hmm. All the other vaccines are are for uh, for adults. Moderna and J and J. Okay. So we have covered a lot of topics today. Do anyone have? Does, does anyone have any last minute thoughts? Any wrap ups? No. Okay. Is, that, is, that, is that to us or is that to our audience? That was to you guys, you, you three. Um, Tiffany, what did you I do? Um, for anybody taking immunosuppressants, how how does that work out with vaccines? Let's so if see. you're taking immunosuppressants, you really need to be talking to your provider, to your physician. We do know that, um, that you can still take the COVID-19 vaccine, but what we... Um, believe is that you're not going to have as robust a response oh, okay. as somebody that that was more healthy and mm -hmm. so you're not as protected if you will you know from the COVID-19 vaccine as somebody that's healthy and doesn't have any you know uh, suppressed system and so again talk to your physician if you have concerns but we do encourage people that are immune compromised to come and get vaccinated as well because it still helps to keep you from getting COVID-19. It just doesn't help at the magnitude that it helps other people at. Thank you for that. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for watching, especially if you submitted a question. In the Q&A, there's no Q without you. To that point, please share this with your friends. There's no telling who you might help by sharing this information. The next task force report will be uploaded next Friday to social media. Please join us every Friday now at 11.30 for the question and answer session. Please remember to direct questions or comments on social media to at CBCOVID. Have a wonderful, safe, and hopefully dry weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.